announcements yet. Um, if you didn't hear that, this meeting is being recorded. Want to make sure you know that. Wanted to ask everyone to please keep your mics muted unless you've been called on to speak um, and so that we're not talking over each other. If you have a question for the guest speakers or for any of us during the event, you can type into the chat box what I'm going to type right now, which is star star hand up, and then you'll join the queue for questions. We'll try to take everybody's questions as we can. There's a few places during the program, and then we'll stay on at the end for any kind of questions, especially voting questions if you have them. Um, and then the last thing was that was it, hands up. So when we get the go ahead, that we have the go ahead, Katie. We are live on Facebook and we are being recorded. All right. Thank you very much, Karen. Welcome everybody to uh, the Arizona State Team of Democrats Abroad kickoff event celebrating statehood today, 110 years ago, and um, defending democracy as well. So I'm going to hand it right over to our international chair, um, Candace Kariston, and everybody, please mute your mics except for Candace. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Katie, for the introduction and good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening to all of you tuning in around the world uh, and a special good morning to those of you joining from Arizona. Very happy Valentine's Day to you as well. And most importantly, why we're here, a happy 110th anniversary of statehood in Arizona. Uh, I think that is certainly a reason to celebrate and very excited to have all of you joining on today's call. Uh, as Katie mentioned, my name is Candace Karastan, and it's my honor to serve as Democrats Abroad's International Chair. For those of you who might not be as familiar with us, what you might be asking, what is Democrats Abroad? We are the largest organization of U.S. citizens living outside of the United States, and we are also an official arm of the Democratic Party, working side by side with sister parties like the Arizona Democratic Party, who's joining us today. It's our mission to provide Americans a voice in our government back home and to elect Democrats by mobilizing the overseas vote. What does that mean in a year like this? Well, as you know, there is so much at stake. 34 U.S. Senate seats, all 435 U.S. representative seats, 46 state legislatures, and 36 state governorships are up for grabs this November. These are the offices where decisions that impact your life and your family's day-to-day -day lives are made, both at home and abroad. Offices where decisions on climate justice, reproductive rights, quality affordable education, healthcare, voting rights, and so much more are made. And as Americans abroad, our voices count. As we look to 2022, Democrats Abroad has set out to bring the elections and the issues closer to you, Americans living overseas, so that you know who and what is on the ballot, and so that lawmakers stateside know about the issues unique to our community. For the first time, we're forming Democrats Abroad state teams, like Arizonans Abroad, to focus on our global efforts on the battleground states and key races. Today, we're looking at Arizona. Critical races in Arizona this year include the U.S. Senate seat held by Mark Kelly, several Dem-held U.S. House seats, the governorship, attorney general, secretary of state, and many state legislative races that could help us gain a majority in one or both houses of the Arizona state legislature. Arizona may be purple, now we wanna help turn it blue, despite redistricting challenges. So how do we do this? If you haven't yet, please request your ballot now at votefromabroad.org. The Arizona primary isn't until August, but do it now and make sure that you are all set to get your primary ballot and your November general election ballot. Again, it's a one-stop shop at votefromabroad.org. You'll get ballots then for all 2022 races. We'll talk a little bit more about the process of voting from abroad after our first guest speaker. Just one quick note, and then we'll dive into the program. Democrats Abroad, as an official Democratic state party, does not endorse any candidates, and we are committed to remaining neutral until this Arizona August primary is over. We'll hold online candidate forums in the spring and summer and invite all Democratic candidates who made it onto the ballot in Arizona. Once we have the nominees after the August 2nd primary, we will work like crazy to help get them elected in November, and I hope that all of you tuning in on this call will help us do just that. 
I'd like to thank our Arizona State team, including Katie Sullen for organizing today's kickoff event to give us a view from on the ground in Arizona and for a calling to all Arizonans abroad to act. Also grateful to our guest speakers, including Adrian, Charlie, and Debbie for taking the time to join us on today's call. I'll turn it over now to Evie Walls and Katie Solon, the co-chairs of the Arizona State team to tell you more about the team's work and today's speakers. Katie and Evie, thank you again for your work on this event and the floor is yours. Thank you, Candace and Avi, you need to unmute, please. Okay, yes, <laughs> sorry about that. All right, thank you very much, Candace, for this great opening. And thank you for all our Arizonans abroad for this kickoff event and for our birthday celebration for statehood. Thank you for joining us to hear our immediate past Maricopa County recorder, the executive director of the Arizona Democratic Party and the first Native American DC member from Arizona. I'm Evie Walls and I'm the former Democrat abroad of Wiesbaden Mines chapter chair. I was born and raised in Tucson, Arizona, but have lived in Germany for the past 30 plus years. I'm an Arizona voter and in Pima County, and I'm pr proud to say that I'm in a blue county in a red state. And it's been my pleasure to be part of this forming of the state committee to be able to find, assist, and encourage Arizonans abroad to cast their votes up and down the ballot. We're going to be having our, our planning meeting tomorrow. So if any of you on now can join us for our Arizona's Abroad planning meeting at 10 o'clock Arizona time. You can also join us on Arizona Abroad Facebook page as well as on Slack. We'll be putting a lot of these information on the chat. But as Candace already said, two important things is please go to votefromabroad.org to request your ballot for the 2022 election. It's going to be so, so critical. And we'll be discussing how to do that more at the very end of the meeting. And we'll also have more information about how to sign candidates petitions also later in the program. And now I'd like to turn it over to my co-chair, Katie. Um, thank you, Avi. Uh, I'm really happy to be working with Avi and all of the other Arizona and not Arizona volunteers who have been stepping up to form this team. We have lots to do. We welcome you to join us um, and we need your ideas and we need you. I am born in Nebraska, but I've been voting in Scottsdale for some years uh, near Phoenix in Maricopa County. I've lived around the world for 40 gulp years. Um, February is my anniversary, mostly in Europe, but also in Southeast Asia, Central America and Africa. I've been active with Democrats Abroad since 2003 and I'm one of our eight DNC members. In 2020, we overseas voters did a great job in Arizona for the top of the ticket. We nearly doubled our vote to 19,000 votes. And if you recall, President Biden won by 12,000. So we provided the margin there. Um, however, Arizona is a case study in the consequences of not voting down ballot. We didn't and hundreds of thousands of other Democrats in Arizona also didn't. And we are feeling the, the consequences, the results every day as our Republican led legislature goes wild with any number of bad bills. So we are really determined as the Arizona state team to turn out more midterm voters than ever before and to really urge all Arizonas, Arizonans abroad who can to vote down ballot. The state legislature is controlled by only one seat by Republicans in both houses. This is flippable. And then you heard about these other critical races where we intend to make the difference. The governorship, Senate, US House, Secretary of State, Attorney General, and many other state and local races. How are we going to do this and how can you help? We're gonna be phone banking all of our Arizona voters. We're gonna be using the state voting lists 
to reach way beyond our membership to other overseas Americans. We're gonna be sending postcards and postal mailers, offering voter registration and assistance to universities, study abroad programs, off base, going on military bases as nonpartisans, every place where we know there are groups of Americans. We're gonna be working bilingually along the border and we're gonna be working with our caucuses and our partners in the US. We're gonna be using saguaros and fish tacos. Those are the two things I thought of yesterday is what I miss when I'm gone from Arizona, but we're gonna be all over social media reminding people about what they miss about Arizona and that they're part of our state. So now I think we're just on time almost to move to our first guest speaker. Um, Adrian, are you on? Well, he's on, good. So I'm gonna introduce you. Yay, nice to see you. Um, to see you, Katie. Are, it's such a pleasure for us to welcome the immediate past Maricopa County Recorder responsible in that position for more than 60% of the voters in Arizona and for the second largest voting jurisdiction in the United States, grew to that size under his leadership. Adrian served as the recorder from 2016 to 2020. He reformed a broken, outdated and unjust voting system and made elections in Arizona more accessible and more secure. His administration set up an infrastructure for elections that served record voter turnout in 2020 he worked with political and community organizations across the political spectrum to increase registered voters by 500,000 people, making us that second biggest, uh, second largest voting juris jurisdiction. He grew up in the border town of Nogales. He served four years in the US Marine Corps, received his bachelor's from ASU and his law degree from the University of Denver, and after that worked as a prosecutor. In 2016, after witnessing shameful voter suppression tactics, including six hour lines at the polls, he decided to run for the Maricopa County Recorder and he won. He became the first Latino to serve in a countywide office and the first Democrat to hold the recorder's office for 50 years. He recently declared his, his candidacy for another, for a statewide office and while we wish him very well, today he's invited not as a candidate, but as a voting rights expert and champion. And Adrian, we hope that you'll come back to a candidate forum as soon as we start holding them after the filing deadline in April. Thank you so much for joining. Also, it looks like from a very careful driving position and for filling us in on the shifting landscape of voter suppression and intimidation uh, in Arizona. And we invite you to speak for as long as you want. And if you can stay on for some questions afterwards, that would be really wonderful. Thank you, Adrian. Mike, thank you so, Thank you so much, Katie. And uh, uh, thank you so much to Democrats abroad and all of the Arizona Democrats uh, across the globe. It's such an honor to be uh, chatting with you all today. And as you, as Katie mentioned, and as you noticed, I just dropped off a kid because it's uh, eight ten, and I've got my kids this week, but I wouldn't miss the opportunity to chat with you all today. And thank you so much to Democrats abroad for doing the hard work that needed to be done, particularly during 2020. You made an incredible difference uh, at the top of the ballot uh, for Arizona. And I think um, we all working together as Democrats can make a much uh, a, a bigger and more lasting difference in 2022. Uh, don't worry, folks. I'm not ignoring you. Uh, I'm just keeping both eyes on the road. Uh, Arizona is at a, at a crossroads right now, as are so many other states in the United States of America. Republican legislatures in at least 43 different states, as far as we can tell, have moved very, very uh, aggressively towards voter suppression tactics uh, that are going to have very negative impacts on voters, perhaps even voters like you. For example, in Texas right now, we're seeing efforts uh, that in uh, current voting are getting uh, vote by mail ballots sent back to voters. Uh, this would be devastating, particularly for Democrats abroad, if this sort of activity happened here in Arizona, particularly since mail uh, across the ocean sometimes takes a little bit of time. Although I know there are all kinds of other alternative means for voting. Uh, and as one of the folks introducing here today said, I apologize for not remembering your name. Uh, it is incredibly important that your local election administrator knows who you are, where you are, 
and that you're in contact with those individuals early. Remember, in Arizona, we have elections in March, May, August, and November, just about every year. School district bonds and overrides are incredibly important. Many municipalities have elections. Uh, local elections happen all year around. Uh, you've got cities and towns like in the metro area, Tempe and Chandler, who have elections uh, on the table. You've got uh, school districts in Pima County, where I was the chief deputy after I served as county recorder here in Maricopa County, who have these kinds of elections uh, and recently just went through some stuff in November. Uh, the, it is important for you as voters, particularly as Democrats, to stay engaged, stay involved. And in Arizona specifically, now I don't know how it works for other states, if there are Democrats abroad from other states here, uh, this might work for you as well. Check with your county clerks, check with your county election boards. Almost all elections are run at the county level in the United States of America. So in Arizona, it's the county recorder of which I am a former office holder, uh, who is the registrar of voters and is responsible for all early voting. Make sure that you take a moment uh, and figure out what you need to figure out. I know Democrats Abroad has some great resources to help you all figure that out very easily. Uh, and so I encourage everyone to take advantage of that. Now, insofar as some of the specifics are concerned, boy, there are so many different things happening at the Arizona legislature uh, that are trying to push back against the progress that we've made. Uh, but let's just take a quick moment and review some of the really positive things that are lasting in Arizona. For example, we have online voter registration. We were one of the first, if not the first state in the nation to have that. Over 80% of our voters voted by mail in the 2020 election. Even during the pandemic, we set turnout records across all of Arizona, due in part to the hard work uh, committed, not just by organizations like yours, but the Arizona Democratic Party and a lot of the candidates who were on the ballot. We need to make sure that the excitement is up for 2022. There are offices across the United States who need us, those of us on this call, particularly who are really interested in this, to get out there and push the agenda for Democrats. Now, the Republicans, um, uh, barring the very specifics, uh, they're just making it, trying to make it harder for folks to vote. They do only have here in Arizona a one vote advantage. And by the way, I did forget this, uh, and I should have said it. I tweeted it out earlier. Happy birthday, Arizona, 110 years old and never looking better. Uh, I, I think we're great. A lot of good things in the future. Uh, so really what we need to do is focus on, uh, as indicated earlier, a lot of these down ballot races. Now, I myself uh, ran in 2020. Uh, we missed the mark by about 4,500 votes out of nearly 2 million cast. Now, think about that margin. It's incredibly tight. Those kinds of percentages uh, are what we're going to be looking at uh, in November of 2022 and beyond. But I think from a strategic perspective and moving forward, it's important for all of us to remember and realize that the Trump census undercounted many, many communities in Arizona. A lot of people of color, a lot of communities uh, of color did not get counted the way that they should have. And so that skewed uh, the redistricting uh, that, ha that happened. And I think we've got a lot of potential to pick up ground in a lot of communities that were undercounted, particularly for statewide races. And I think it might make some significant difference in legislative races. We need to be on the ground doing what we can here in Arizona. But that also means uh, that outreach from you all to those other Arizonans who are out there serving in the foreign service, in military, uh, in other posts across the globe, really need to buckle down and get as many of our Arizona voters turned out as possible. Now, ID requirements uh, are up and coming. Uh, reducing um, not just polling places into formulas that don't help, but trying to take away the vote center model that we had in Maricopa County that's been useful in helping voters in Yavapai County, for example, since 2012. Those are two of the issues that are on the table right now at the legislature. Uh, there are a number of other ways that they are trying to manipulate systems, uh, some of them radical, some of them not so radical. Uh, some of them, even as a former election administrator, I very much agree with our political opponents on. Uh, for example, um, one of the Republicans uh, who is um, at, at the legislature, we won't get into the politics of it, uh, proposed that ballot images be published online. Well, there's a jurisdiction uh, in the world that has a 98 percent confidence rate in their elections, uh, and they post all of their ballot images online. That jurisdiction is Mongolia. I don't know if we've got anybody on the call from Mongolia, but you can see at the precinct level, 
those ballots and you can count them your darn self if you want. Uh, that really helps to alleviate a lot of the concerns that end up happening. And we're fighting against misinformation and disinformation. Uh, so even a broken clock can be right once in a while. Uh, and so on those specific points, I will acknowledge that good policy has to trump politics. And we have to be cognizant of that as we move forward. Uh, some of the other things I think that are really important for you uh, as Democrats abroad to follow, uh, as, as it might have been mentioned, is look look to the primaries as well. Now, I'm in a, 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 a political contest. We won't do any self-promotion here. But I think the important thing is this. As we push our numbers up, as we move forward, we have to understand that independent, nonpartisan voters in Arizona can draw a primary ballot. If you're out there on those military... and draw a Democratic primary ballot. They can have an impact with us and for us. And usually what we understand is that an individual who votes in a primary for a party generally tends to vote for that party in the general election. So what we're doing here is creating conversations among folks who are not registered as Democrats to try to bolster greater numbers as we move from our uh, first part of August, I think it's August 2nd this year primaries, into the November election. So it's a little bit of policy here, it's a little bit of politics, but at the end of the day, what we're really doing is fighting against the misinformation and disinformation by sharing trusted information and the right information with voters. Again, for Arizona, folks can go to any of the, um, the uh, uh, Democrats abroad uh, websites that are mentioned. I'm sure someone's gonna put them in the chat for you as resources. But at the same time, in Arizona, the county recorders are your registrar of voters. They're the ones that are going to help. And I will tell you this, to a person, every county recorder in Arizona takes great pride in assisting and helping uh, voter uh, overseas uh, and voters abroad of any party to vote. They want to get those numbers up because it's just part of their job. And it's something that they can really crow about when they get together of the increase in percentage of voters abroad and stuff. I know I've been in those meetings. It's phenomenal. So uh, I just wanted to share some of that basic information, not get too much into the weeds on policy. And here's why. We're so early in the legislative process right now. We don't know what's going to come up, what's real, what we need to really focus on yet until they start switching them back and forth between chambers. And still a lot of these votes uh, or a lot of these bills start getting heard, uh, but we have to be vigilant, particularly in this legislative session. And there's also one other thing I think that's going to be important. And I'll queue up Charlie for this one because I don't have the specific information. Uh, I know the executive director of the Arizona State Party is on here. Charlie, if you could give just a tiny bit about the RTS system uh, that might help folks abroad. Uh, influence our legislature here in Phoenix, that would be phenomenal too. It's a good way for folks to have their voices heard at the legislature. And I understand those folks actually pay attention to that part uh, and not some of the other parts. Uh, I'm, going, I'm happy to answer questions now or to wait on the call and answer them later. I don't want to take too much time, but I am very, very happy to be here. I'm always a resource for folks. Katie can find me whenever she wants because uh, she and I go back. Gosh, I don't know, Katie, how long have we known each other? Two years now? <laughs> which in politics can seem like a long time. Anyway, I'm Adrian Fontes. Happy to hang around and answer some questions, uh, if not right now, later. Uh, and I'll, I'll throw it back to the moderators. Thank you so much for having me. Adrian, thank you so much for joining us and for being such a safe driver. Um, we could take time for a couple of questions. And if people have a question, you can type star star hand up in the box and we'll call on you. But in the meantime, I would say that those 4,500 votes that Adrian was missing for re-election in 2020, we had them and we didn't deliver them. There were 12,000 votes probably in Maricopa County from abroad. And we know that there were a good number who weren't voting down ballot because we've been voting, we've had a focus on federal elections for our first 50 years of life as Democrats abroad, but we are turning that corner and we are focusing now on including state and local elections and everyone in Arizona who can, please vote down ballot. We'll be telling you how to do that. And we'll also be talking about RTS. So um, is there a question in the box? Beverly, I don't see one yet. Someone tried to unmute though, who was that? Did, does someone have a question? 
No, then I'll ask one. Um, Adrian, you, we're also gonna be talking about petition signing and how to do it. We're gonna be talking about the right to speak later on. Um, my question, my first question was, um, many of these bills that are being passed in Arizona and in other states are in response to what is a false narrative of failed election uh, accessibility and security and transparency. Can you tell us a little bit about the Arizona system that you helped set up that had all of these safeguards built into it all along the way um, and that absolutely don't need to be corrected in Arizona because things worked very well in 2020? Well, Katie, thank you for that. Um, I, but, but I'll take a slightly different approach to why we're having these challenges. We're having these challenges because big Trump and his big lie uh, doesn't know how to lose gracefully. Uh, and he's an anti-American wannabe autocrat. Uh, so let's, I, I like calling a spade a spade. Uh, but the result of that and one of the symptoms is a lot of these legislatures around the world um, around the United States uh, are, are doing these sorts of things. The system that we have set up is an incredibly complex system. Um, I, I liken it to an iPhone. Okay, I'm on uh, an iPhone right now. I, I point, I swipe, I get my music, I can talk to people around the globe. It's like magic and it works instantaneously. Election systems are not dissimilar and the one we have here is not dissimilar. It's a very, very easy thing for Arizona voters to do. You can sign up for what used to be the permanent early vote list, now just the Arizona early vote list, and you get your ballot for every election. Hopefully you vote in every election and you send it back. We also set up a system that would give you an automatically generated text message or uh, email message when your ballot was printed and coming to you, when it got back to the election department, so that you could verify that your ballot was actually turned in. Uh, it showed up and could be, uh, you know, you could count on it was going to be tabulated. Uh, we instituted some policies back in 2018 that ended up becoming law regarding uh, curing of mismatched signatures and missing signatures. In Maricopa County, we have a very, we have and had a very robust system uh, that really had multiple layers of accountability, multiple layers of processes that in, very importantly were set up ahead of time uh, and were established in writing and then executed as written. Here's the important part about this, uh, again, without getting too much into the specific details, Maricopa County's 2020 election stands today as the single most highly scrutinized election in American history. And the bipartisan team under my leadership that came forward, put all those new systems into place, including new high-speed tabulators, including a new adjudication system that would allow for much more quick processing of writing candidates, for example, um, of any overvotes that may have happened in specific contests, for example, with bipartisan teams. Uh, we reconfigured the physical ballot tabulation space so that the server itself could be monitored by anyone on 24 seven camera so that observers could come in and look and actually see that the only thing that the server was attached to were the computers in the ballot tabulation center. There were no internet connections. It was completely off uh, of, the, of the internet grid and isolated air gapped system is what we call it. So all of these things we put into place and what was the result? Well, not even the cyber ninjas and all of those folks uh, could figure out a way uh, to say that the election was bad. And so every step of the way from signature verification of our envelopes uh, for which all of our staff and workers are trained by the same forensic training experts that train the FBI uh, through to bipartisan teams that transport equipment and ballots from the several hundred vote centers across Maricopa County back to the tabulation center uh, and, and, and everything in between, including the canvas, uh, which happens by uh, the county board of supervisors, which is effectively uh, our county election board here under Arizona statute. So every step of the way, it's a bipartisan process. Every step of the way we have accountability uh, and we did a bang up job in 2020, uh, really in a bipartisan way, which I'm incredibly proud of. And so um, the undermining of this is motivated by the big lie. And that's why I think we have great opportunities because those folks represent a minority of overall voters. And the overall voters are the ones that are going to end up mattering uh, most when we get to the general election in 2022, uh, which I've already spoken to just a little bit. So I, I hope that kind of gets to some of the points you wanted me to talk about, Katie. 
Thanks, Adrian. Meredith Wheeler from Toulouse, France. Would you ask your questions really quickly? Yes. Thanks so much, Thanks. Adrian. Um, it sounds like you have best practices going on in Arizona. And I'm wondering if you share those best practices with other states. I vote, for instance, in New York State. And I'm just wondering, do you people all get together and share your best practices? And are there states that you think are doing a lousy job or that you're willing to talk about? And finally, my question is, how much pressure were you under by the Trumpers? Did you feel threatened, personally threatened? Wow, uh, that's a whole stack of questions, Meredith. Thank it you is. so much. Sorry. And I, and I'm an I, external. I hope you're, <laughs> I hope you're having a great, uh, I hope you're having, well, I, I can hear a tinge of that in, in your questioning. Uh, look, uh, thank you for coming, uh, being, I guess, doing whatever you're doing in Toulouse. Um, we are um, always sharing information among election experts in the United States. I am uh, personally CIRA certified. CIRA is a certified election and registration administrator out of the election center in Auburn University. Um, so that certification is something that I get being part of this national program. And we do get together, like just about any other profession, uh, accountants or lawyers or whatnot, but we get together across the United States of America and support each other. We've got jurisdictions uh, enormously diverse right here in Arizona. So, you know, Greeley County, I believe, nice has walk. something in the neighborhood of about 42, 45,000 uh, uh, folks in it completely. Maricopa County is a little different with well over four and a half million uh, and yet we've got similar processes and procedures. We do share across the United States of America best practices. Uh, there are some journals that work on that. Um, and, and, and so that network is pretty tight. I know a lot of folks around the country from my time at Maricopa County, and I still get calls occasionally from friends uh, in Ohio and in Michigan uh, and in New Hampshire. Uh, and as a matter of fact, uh, I was in New York the day before you all got your early voting, your new early voting started uh, in Manhattan. Uh, the boroughs were uh, having a little bit of a panic over there because they had never done early voting before. They were doing nine days of early voting in, in um, I think it was 20, uh, it wasn't 2020, it would have been 2019 uh, or 2018. I'll tell you what, uh, it was 2019 and they were having a panic and I just tried to stay out of the way because we have 27 days of early voting, but we did talk a lot. Now, uh, your question about which are some of the jurisdictions that have issues. Uh, frankly, there are some jurisdictions that are very dark blue that have significant voter access issues like New York. It's not unusual for New Yorkers in the city to spend hours at a time in line. And it's an expected part of the culture. Whereas out here in Arizona, you stand in line for more than 25 or 30 minutes and people are yelling and screaming on Twitter. So it, it, it really depends on the local culture across the United States, what the voters expect, what they're used to, uh, and, and, and the way that the systems end up operating. Uh, so some are better than others, uh, but we don't have a real standard across the United States. I'll just take a real quick second to say that was one of the reasons why I was so much uh, an advocate uh, of what was SR, uh, HR1, uh, and and the, uh, the recent efforts to try to standardize some of the basic core practices of voting across the United States of America. We don't have a national standard from which we can measure state A against state B. And so they all operate independently as well they should based on the federal republic that we operate under. However, we've got to have some standardization so we can help determine whether or not resources are being allocated properly in order to see what the impact is on fundamental rights of citizens vis-a-vis uh, -vis that comparison one state to another. So uh, a big question. I hope I packed everything in. I did miss the one part about uh, did I feel threatened? Um, I'll go back to 2018 to illustrate. Um, one day I got a phone call. Uh, my my ex-wife uh, had told me that one of the kids brought a package in from the front porch. Uh, we ended up having the bomb squad over and evacuated uh, several houses on our block. Now, I didn't talk a lot about that until I got summoned to speak to Congress regarding threats against election officials. Uh, but all you've got to do is check the record and you'll see uh, that members of my staff, members of the secretary's staff, members of election officials staffs and election officials themselves across the United States of America have experienced an, an incredible tidal wave of threats. They have not abated. Uh, folks are still getting threatened. And it is not a partisan thing. Republicans and Democrats alike across the United States of America are facing threats. Uh, They're facing threats of violence. Uh, and it's a terrible, terrible devolution 
uh, of our civic conversation that is uh, American democracy. And so uh, it's a bad situation uh, that I hope we can turn the corner on, uh, but that's going to take a lot of work. And honestly, it's going to take electing a lot more Democrats. Let me just say that. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those answers, Adrian. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, we're going to turn really quickly before we get to Charlie uh, and talk about how people living abroad can vote in Arizona. Uh, what are the five steps? So I'm going to call now on Jim, who's going to say his last name for us, because I'm sure I won't say it correctly, and Kate Sawyer to just quickly, very quickly, if you can, run through those five steps. And we'll get back to you, voting experts, later in the program um, to go into more detail and to take questions from voters. But uh, Jim, if you could share your screen and yeah. if you and Kate could go for it, please. Uh, there we go. Okay, Kate, are you there too? I'm here. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'm Jim Witt of Rungle. Uh, I uh, lived in Phoenix and taught in the Madison School District for 29 years. And then 21 years ago, I moved here to Germany to teach at the Munich International School. And I now live in Augsburg and love it. But I'm still tied to Arizona and uh, Arizona is important. Kate, you want to? Yeah, so I'm Kate Sawyer. I've been living in Frankfurt for um, seven years. I'm involved on this just because I've done a lot of um, voter protection and voter assistance work for Democrats abroad. Okay. All right. We're going to talk about the uh, five steps to making sure that you have voted and uh, that you can vote, you have voted, and that you uh, your ballot counted. All right. The five steps for voting in Arizona are first, you need to request your ballot. Uh, I believe Cindy popped a question a little while ago about uh, how do I get my ballot. You request the ballot and it will register you to vote as needed as well. You're going to then track your request. You'll receive your ballot 45 days before the election. You'll vote and return your ballot as soon as possible, and then you will track your, va your ballot. Now, go into a little bit more detail on these. Requesting your ballot. Uh, Adrian said, you know, you can get on the automatic voter list. Uh, good. How long it will last, we don't know. That's all subject to change by legislature and so on. So we recommend. Democrats abroad recommend that you request your ballot every election year. And we also recommend, there are several ways to get that, but we also recommend going to votefromabroad.org and complete the one page form. Uh, this form both requests your ballot and serves as voter registration or modification of your registration as needed. On that form, you're gonna find a checkbox and that checkbox is receive your ballot by email or online. We strongly recommend that you check that box. That way your ballot will come to you over your computer. Um, be sure, if you're doing this by the way, be sure that you clearly give your email address in number four so that they are sending it to the right place. And then we recommend you keep a copy of this. Keep it at hand until the election is over. Um, yeah, I'll just interject there. It's critical, especially for younger voters uh, um, like my own um, uh, young adult children, is that they keep a copy of the form they filed because they can look at their signature, especially young people, their signatures change. So it's important when they sign their ballot that the signature is the same signature as the one they, they um, used for their registration or ballot request form. Okay, good. Um, track your request. You will have the ability to follow that uh, form that you filled in. Wait about a week and then go to www.arizona.vote. That's an odd looking uh, email address uh, because of the, the tag on the end. 
it is just Arizona.vote. There's nothing else that goes on that. When you go in there, it's a really simple a website to follow, and you can confirm that your request was it received and accepted, okay? If you have any problems, and you're going to see this on just about every slide here, contact us. We're here to help, and we will be more than happy to help you with any problems, okay? Next. All right, you've requested your ballot. You should receive your ballot. Counties are required by law, federal law, to make uh, overseas ballots available for voters 45 days before the election. And again, we have recommended that you receive it email, online portal. You can receive it by mail. It will not be there 45 days before the election. I can just about guarantee you. Email and online portal, it will. Getting your ballot by email is the fastest and it is the most secure way of doing so. Again, questions or problems, contact us. Return your ballot. Yeah, well, okay, let's do a few things before we return the ballot. Number one, print it, vote it, sign it. You'll actually be signing a separate sheet that looks like uh, a mail envelope uh, that you would send in and submit your ballot. And there are several ways to do that. It will be clear uh, as you uh, go through the portal process on that. Submit that ballot as soon as possible. Why? If there's any problems, you've got more time to solve the problems. Submit via email attachment, portal upload, or postal mail. Once again, email and uh, the portal upload are your best ways to go. So we recommend the email and online uh, <coughs> submissions. Okay, number five, track your ballot. Okay, you track your registration, you track your ballot. We're Arizonans, good logic of the, uh, of the uh, saloon gambler, trust your friends, cut the cards, okay? We wanna do the same, always track your ballot. Confirm that your ballot was received and accepted. And if there are any problems or questions, you can ask us and you can work on curing the problems on your ballot. We heard a lot of talk last election about curing a ballot. Maricopa County particularly, and I believe Pima County do a really good job of taking care of that. But these are the things that you need to do, okay? So your five steps to vote in Arizona from abroad, request your ballot, do that as soon as possible. Track your request. You'll receive your, ba your ballot 45 days before the election. Vote and return that ballot as soon as possible. So you have time to cure if necessary, and then track that ballot to make sure that it was received and it was accepted and you're being counted. Okay. From that, other important issues in Arizona. One of the other boxes that you will check on your form, full ballot or federal ballot. In other words, if you check, I intend to return, you receive a full ballot with all of the state offices, including the critical ones. If you check return uncertain, you will most likely only receive a federal ballot. That means president, senator, congressperson. You may be required to upload proof of your citizen, particularly if you have checked the uh, I intend to return box. Okay, think down ballot. This has been a real emphasis all the way through that you heard right at the very beginning. If you intend to return, it is critical that you vote in uh, the state elections. You have a right to return at any time. So think about it. Can you legitimately say that at some point in time, you may find yourself returning and you are comfortable with saying, I intend to return, then go ahead and check that. That will make you eligible for the full ballot. 
State elections have consequences as we are seeing all over the place. Governor, Secretary of State, legislature, county recorder, and uh, I'll add to that Board of Supervisors for the county, uh, as Adrian pointed out, uh, this is a very important position. These people have the most control over how you vote, when you vote, and your ability to vote. So they are very important offices. This is down ballot. Jim, okay. thank you so much. Thank you very much for this thorough explanation of the five steps. We're not able to take questions on voting now. We can come back at the end of the program. Any voters that have questions, uh, please, please stay on and ask us or go to info at democratsabroad.org. Jim and Kate, thanks so much for this presentation. We're gonna mm -hmm. jump now to Charlie Fisher, who is the executive director of the Arizona Democratic Party. Charlie, I know we're a little bit behind. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, I'm gonna do a quick introduction. A native of Arizona, Charlie Fisher has been the executive director of the Arizona Democratic Party since November, 2020. He's been active in local and state politics and advocacy since 2013, starting his career in environmental advocacy before working for campaigns to reelect then Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton and expand light rail in the city. He's managed a legislative campaign, worked for the Arizona Education Association and fought to protect the Affordable Care Act with Children's Action Alliance. From 2018 to 2020, he led the Arizona Democratic Legislative Campaign Committee, the ADLCC, which we are going to talk about later, as executive director, and then he was the candidate services and political director. He's born and raised in Scottsdale, my neighborhood. Charlie is a lifelong Arizonan. He graduated from Whittier College in Southern California and then returned home and began his career in advocacy and electoral politics. Charlie, we're so honored that you're with us. We know that Mondays are a busy day for you and, and all the folks working at the Arizona Democratic Party. So the mic is yours. And if you have time, we'll have some questions when you finish. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. I uh, appreciate it. And good morning or Good day to everyone uh, scattered across the globe here from Phoenix. Um, like Katie said, my name is Charlie Fisher. I'm, I'm really excited to, uh, to be with you all um, today. So um, I'm going to touch on a couple of different things and then absolutely happy to, to stay for as many, as many questions as, um, as you all have. Um, so first, wanted to wanted to sort of kick off this morning by giving everyone a brief overview about the redistricting process. Um, as you all will be aware, we have a, an independent commission here in Arizona. And so um, for better or for worse, I think it, it, it sort of started as a, definitely a best practice in a national model for how to take the, the partisan politics out of this process. And like all well-meaning, well-intended efforts, it has been slowly sort of corrupted and, um, and, and changed over time. And so um, I will start by saying, um, you know, the governor, Governor Ducey, over the, his eight years uh, as the governor has really strategically and systematically remade the Commission on Appellate Court Appointments here in Arizona, which is the larger body that approves judicial nominations, but also submits um, candidates to be independent redistricting commissioners. And so um, that body, unfortunately, really did stack the deck against us throughout this process from the beginning and again, going back years. Um, Despite those dynamics, well, I, I will say, so the, the effort there really is to, is to get as many sort of Republican leaning independents to be qualified by the commission so that then they could be put forward as, uh, as the, independent, the all important independent chair of our five, five person commission. Um, the governor unfortunately was, was successful in this effort and we saw time and time again throughout the process, the, the chair did vote with the two Republican commissioners and, and it gave a 3-2 majority to, to many of their interests and many of their, um, their testimony. Uh, despite those dynamics and those very real challenges, um, we, we went all in as the Arizona Democratic Party in total coalition throughout this process. Uh, we had a phenomenal and still have a phenomenal elections director, Franny Sharp, who worked almost exclusively on redistricting for, for nearly three years 
worked over Christmas, over New Year's, over every major holiday. For some reason, this commission seemed to like make big news right before the holidays when we're supposed to have a couple of weeks off. Um, and Franny was was incredible throughout this process. Um, so aside from the staff investments, uh, which were, were sizable, we also had an incredible team of lawyers um, and academic uh, analysts who were constantly assessing and reassessing each iteration of the maps throughout the process. Um, we had had teams of academics and, and mapping and data experts who were, you know, sort of iterating and reiterating different maps and and doing our best to prepare our democratic commissioners ahead of each meeting to, to really advocate for fair and competitive maps, to advocate for communities of interest, um, and, to, and to make sure that the, the maps that were ultimately approved reflect the incredible political competitiveness that we have here in Arizona. Um, and, and like I said, we did all of this in, in complete coalition with a number of partners, including the, the National Democratic Redistricting Committee, um, who were engaged from the beginning, local groups like One Arizona and Arizona Wins, as well as less formal um, organizations like the, the Latino Coalition for Fair Redistricting and all of our you know, 22 tribal nations. Um, and so despite, despite all of, again, all those dynamics and all of that investment, you know, we certainly did not get the maps that we had hoped for, um, but it also could have been so much worse. And I, and I do wanna remind folks that the maps that we got in, in 2011 um, sort of had a similar dynamic. We had a, we had a stronger chair at the time um, who, who did sort of side with, with Democrats and um, you know, more consistently, but those maps got better and better over the decade that they were in place as do, you know, because of demographic changes, because of folks moving in and moving out um, and folks just sort of changing the way that they, that they um, considered voting and, and what they prioritized. And so I do wanna leave us on a, a hopeful note and in redistricting and, and the reality is that at the congressional level, um, we, we have went from three safe democratic seats to two safe democratic seats. Uh, we went from, you know, three, we, or we, we held, we went from three safe Republican seats to four safe Republican seats, but we still do have three competitive led, uh, congressional districts. Um, that being a newly created one here in, in the East Valley, that is David Schweikert is the incumbent, um, who has been damaged uh, over the years for sure and, and just made news over the weekend his campaign was fined uh, a fresh $125,000 for ethics violations and so um, excited that there is new opportunity to uh, to oppose uh, you know David Schweiker here at the congressional level. Um, we also have a newly created Southeast Valley seat that Congressman Stanton um, represents and, and will run to represent again um, that I feel fairly confident about and then We've got a Southern Arizona-based district that is the new number six. Uh, we have two incredible Democratic candidates running for the nomination. Um, and although that is a, a slight GOP lean, it could be a challenge. Um, I, I feel like, you know, we are invested. I know that national partners are invested in making sure that we retain that seat that's currently currently held by Congressman Kirkpatrick. Um, and, and I think we have a similar story at the legislative level. Um, and, and I loved the, the speaker before me really emphasizing down ballot and, and making sure everyone knows how to, how to get the full state election because those races are so, so critical this year and every year. Um, we, are, have, we have as narrow uh, divides at the legislative level as possible with just one seat majorities in either chamber. And these maps do you know, give us the, the opportunity to continue to, add, you know, to continue to fight for majorities with, with five competitive legislative districts. We got 12 safe uh, Democrat, three safe Republican, and five that are, are competitive. Um, a, a handful of those do lean uh, a little hev more heavily towards Republicans. Um, but again, with the, with the work of ADLCC, with the work that we're doing here at ADP and all of the incredible candidates, um, we, fe we feel pretty good. Um, I want to pivot really quickly to targeted races. Uh, I will start with the, the likely most obvious one is we must do everything in our power to reelect Senator Kelly. Um, without Senator Kelly in the Senate, it is highly unlikely that Democrats will, will retain our majority. Um, and we've seen how many times we've had to call on, on the vice president to come and pass, uh, pass the priorities of this administration and, and what it's meant for, for the country and, and for Americans you know, across the world. Um, so it starts absolutely with, with Senator Kelly and his reelection. Um, and we also have to, we have to do everything we can to advocate for our members of Congress, whether they're running for reelection or will be nominated here in, in August. Um, but I really want to focus today what, uh, what Jim and, and, and Kate, you mentioned uh, briefly before me, which is the importance of these state level races. And I'm so excited that you all got to hear from one of our incredible candidates for Secretary of State because 
there are a few, few races more important uh, when we think about the future of, of American democracy, which unfortunately is, is top of mind right now for all of us. Um, but for us, and one of my goals really when I came into this is, is how do we really make sure that Democrats in Arizona and across the country really internalize how important these state level races are and what an immediate and important impact and influence it has on, on the lives of everyday Arizonans. Um, and, and one thing that I think is so exciting is about really making sure that folks understand this is uh, it gives us real incentive to make sure that we're voting every single year not just every four years, not just during presidential elections, which, which we all know has been a, has been a challenge. Um, Democrats are, are not always the most, uh, you know, the most motivated and engaged voters during midterms, and particularly when we're, you know, we have power at the, at the federal level. And so by really influencing um, and impressing upon the importance of state level races, we have an opportunity to turn Democrats into really consistent high level voters, um, which is what we need if we're gonna continue moving Arizona forward. So um, really excited about, um, about the opportunities that we have at the gubernatorial, at the attorney general, at the secretary of state and the corporation commission. Um, Katie mentioned that I, I sort of was motivated to get involved in politics because I, I am really passionate about, about climate issues, about environmental advocacy. And the corporation commission here is such an important and, and I think underappreciated body that can really move us drastically forward from being middle of the road on the best day to, to turning Arizona into a global leader in renewable energy technology and deployment of things like solar um, storage, right? We have, we have an incredible opportunity. And so I think focusing on that race as well. Um, and then the last thing I will say before I, uh, before I pass it back and, and open it up for questions um, is our priority here at ADP is really doubling down on organizing. Um, we, I think for the, for the first time in Arizona history, last summer launched Project 1530, which is our permanent statewide organizing program. Um, one of the criticisms I heard often when I was at ADLCC is that, you know, candidates in whether it's a safe Democratic district or a fairly safe Republican district, there's not much investment from the party. There's not that much engagement because the outcome, you know, when it comes to winners and losers is unfortunately decided in the primary. Um, and, and that leads to this you know, lack of engagement, but also a very transactional nature of sort of assuming support coming in the last, you know, the last month or two months and just chasing ballots, not even really having conversations about democratic values and, and why it's important to turn out and vote um, and, and make sure that we're securing support. And so we launched Project 1530, like I said, last July. It is a nod to our 15 counties and 30 legislative districts here in Arizona. We started with 10 organizers that we have on the ground covering these, these large regions. Um, and, and really the, the theory here is, is threefold, uh, which is getting the, the Democratic Party back into the business of voter registration. We have incredible C3 and Z4 groups here that do this work, but we want the party to be in that space as well. Just having a, a table, a simple tablecloth that says Arizona Democratic Party is a clear signal to people walking by. Um, and although we register everyone and we follow all the rules, you know, when we're doing voter registration, we wanna make sure that folks you know, folks know that we're out there and that we want to engage people. Uh, continuing to enroll people in vote by mail makes it that much easier and that much more efficient for us to, to, to do that turnout work that we need to. Um, about the, the, the second sort of piece is volunteer recruitment, right? And doing it year round, election or not, we know that tens of thousands of people are newly engaged every year. Um, but what happens to those folks when the campaigns end? You know, too often all of that energy and enthusiasm and excitement is sort of let's let's fall through the cracks. Um, and that is a huge missed opportunity to build our party and keep these folks engaged year round advocating for for their communities, whether it be the county um, legislative district all the way down to the precinct. Um, and then lastly, we need to drive turnout like I talked about earlier and we have to start at the bottom of the ballot if we're talking about the legislature. That's an opportunity every two years to completely remake our entire state government. Um, and that's an incredibly exciting opportunity and, and motivator to get folks involved. So um, that's a little bit about, about um, Project 1530 and why I'm so excited. We also have a really, um, a really incredible plan to invest early in, in paid communications in our communities of color across Arizona. Again, rejecting sort of this last minute investment um, and parachuting into communities. We want to we want to be communicating democratic values early, well before we have a nominee, um, and making sure that we are we are you know really investing in persuasion um, across the board. And then, last but not least, I will say that we have just just a couple of weeks ago endorsed a voting rights initiative 
Uh, you all will be aware, unfortunately, it looks like federal voting rights legislation is, is unlikely at this point, um, but we're not gonna be defeated. We're not gonna sit on our hands. Uh, we, we dove right in, endorsed a really important um, statewide ballot initiative that's called Arizonans for Free and Fair Elections. There's actually a briefing a little bit later this afternoon. Um, and we're gonna do everything that we can with our organizing program, with our infrastructure across the state to get that on the ballot because we know that democracy is on the ballot regardless. Um, and so we have to elect Democrats. We have to talk about the future and, and how frankly, there's only one party that believes that everyone should, you know, every eligible voter should be able to participate and have their voice heard. And so um, with that, I will stop rambling. I will pass it back to Katie. Uh, thank you all again for, for the invitation and I'm, I'm happy to take a couple questions. Uh, Charlie, thank you so much. I'm going to pass it to Avi, who's going to moderate the questions. Avi, go ahead. Unmute. Okay, thank you so much, Charlie. You you basically gave us a very wonderful overview. Um, are there questions? Can I? Oh, uh, Tammy from Germany, are you on? Hi, I'm on. Yep. Can you hear me? Okay. Can you ask your question, yeah. please? Yeah, um, well, um, two things. Um, I So I just sent in my ballot request last week, got confirmation very quickly. But something that was different this time is included in the confirmation um, was a note about getting your digital voter ID, um, which I don't remember seeing before. Um, in previous years, that wasn't something that, that so I, I got a digital voter ID, whatever that is now in Arizona. Is that something that's become new? Um, that's one question and and just one point so if you don't know that charlie that's fine <laughs> but i have but to get back, get back to you on saying, that one okay no problem um relevant to what you were saying something that just sort of stuck out in my mind particularly reaching out to communities of color um and and something that i i've you know nationally in the democratic party um you know the attitude with which we come into communities and like you said not parachuting in at the end but really integrating but the attitude with, with the wording that you used is something I'm seeing on the federal level too, is, you know, we're going in and we're persuading. And, and, and I think something that's, that's lacking, and I'd love to see Arizona being the leader on is really less with the attitude of persuading them to what we're, you know, what our values are in, and rather seeing how the values of the party in general are integrated with the core values in these communities already and how they, they work together. So sort of less adversarial, I might say, if communities don't feel like they're already in that an outside group coming in to persuade or to change or something, but with this intention of really um, recognizing these communities are really backbone of the Democratic Party and um, their values are democratic values and just, you know, getting that wording in, in a way that um, may seem less outsider when I think these communities are really the heart of what we do. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think it's a, it, it is a, a shift that we, I, I, we have to make across the board and something that we're really working to internalize here. And I think campaigns by necessity have to make broad based assumptions, right, about groups of people. Um, and, and, and I think too often communities of color are, are painted with one single brush, right? And we know that no community is, is monolithic. Um, and, and I think too often we do put, you know, communities of color into one specific box and, and treat folks the same way. Um, and that's, that's not effective. Um, it, it's not helpful. And, and frankly, I think it's, it's damaging in the long term. And so it's one of the reasons that I'm excited, not only about this paid communications program, because that's really important, but the organizing program specifically, right? The Eight of our 10 organizers are born and raised and living in the communities that they are now advocating for and organizing in every day, right? And so these aren't folks, um, and we love our folks that come in from New York and California and Chicago, right? We want everyone in Arizona working, but um, when it comes to the long-term engagement, someone who you know has their kids at the same school or goes to the same park or deals with the same potholes, right? Is so much easier to have a real conversation and have a dialogue and build a relationship and trust um, than someone who, who maybe has only been in this community for a couple of weeks or a couple of months and, and is only going to be here for a couple of months longer. Um, and so I think that's 
one of the things that's so excited about this organizing and, and, and taking away that sort of like nine month timeline and thinking about the next 10 years and 15 years of the party and these communities. Um, and, and I think you're right, right? I, I, for a long time, we have assumed support and that, and that has sort of led to this cost benefit uh, you know, analysis that we've made of like, okay, well, that community supports us. So we just need to go and make sure that they know where their ballots are and, and to turn them in. Uh, we're not doing that anymore. There is no such thing as, as just a turnout uh, universe or just a persuasion universe. We have to persuade everyone that our values are their values, that uh, electing Democrats and, and increasing democratic power is going to improve the lives of Arizonans across the board. Okay, thank you so much, Charlie. We have a question from Meredith asking about uh, Senator Kelly, thinking that he was a uh, He's a popular senator, so is his race really that close? So, so yes, Senator Kelly is popular, and he's done an unbelievable job in just one, uh, feels like longer than a year, but only one year representing us in the U.S. Senate. Um, yes, his race is absolutely going to be close, um, and we are taking nothing for granted. Um, and, and frankly, that's how I feel about all of our statewide races across the board. We saw... Um, how incredibly close the presidential election was in 2020 and Senator Kelly won by, you know, a, a slightly more comfortable margin, but, but certainly far from actually comfortable and safe. And so we are preparing for another incredibly close election at, at the U.S. Senate level, um, and that extends to all the statewides. And I think for me, that's really energizing, right? A, a lot of voters across the country, they don't, you know, they have influence at the local level. Right. But when it comes to their statewide races, you know, the the dire cast, right, the decision has been made. And here in Arizona, every constituency group. Right. I know we're going to be hearing from one of our fantastic DNC members uh, a little bit later about uh, about engaging, engaging tribal and native communities. Without that engagement, we will not win at the top of the ticket. Without Democrats abroad voting and engaged, we will not win at the top of the ticket. Right. Investing in Latino, Latinx communities. Um, every constituency group matters, but also every volunteer shift, every conversation with friends and families, every like dollar you can give to a candidate that you believe in can make a difference and will make the ultimate difference. So um, Senator Kelly is an incredible fundraiser. He has been a phenomenal senator in, in a year and, and we feel pretty good about his chances, um, but we're, we're not taking anything for granted. Um, we've, got to, we've got to engage now all the way through, through election day and beyond. All right. Thank you so much, Charlie, for joining us today. And we hope to have more conversations with you and your teams. Please know that we're going to be doing everything in our powers to complement your efforts and to turn Arizona voters overseas more than ever before. And now, so that we don't get further behind, and if you're able to stay with us, we'll have more questions at the end. But Katie is due to introduce our last speaker, Katie. All right. Um, thank you, Avi. Thank you, Charlie. Charlie, if you're still there, because I know you're probably may not settled into the call. I've just been communicating with Debbie and we've got another two minutes if you can answer um, these questions quickly if you're still here and if you're gone. But there was a Christian cinema uh, question in the box and we should get to that. Um, it's what to do. The question was what to do about primarying her, but really the question is what to do. And if you want to uh, thread that needle for us, it would be great if you can do it quickly. And then I'm going to save my question for you and Mary Darling later about what are we doing along the border. So we'll, we'll let you handle that hot potato before we go to Debbie, if you could. And uh, yeah. it's nice you only have a minute to do it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> uh, yeah I, I will. I will address it briefly. So. Um, we, of course, we disagree with Senator Sinema on, on the issue of voting rights, and, and we, as the, as the Arizona Democratic Party, have been pretty clear um, about that. Um, you know, we were in the news for, for a, a solid week there after um, our, our January 22nd decision to, to formally censure uh, the senator because of, because of this issue and this disagreement. Um, I, I will say that's not a position that we want to be in. We, as the Arizona Democratic Party, we're, we're not lobbyists, right? We are not policy experts. Um, we, we exist as an organization to support and elect Democrats and, and build power. Um, but this is an issue that we felt like the stakes were too high to be silent. Um, that said, at this point, 
the, the reality is that Senator Sinema is not on the ballot this November. Um, and we do not have the luxury to focus on that when what we've talked about is all still remains the truth, right? Which is we must hold the Senate. We have to elect a Democratic governor and Secretary of State. We can flip the Arizona legislature. And so that's what we're laser focused on. We have made our disagreement known. Um, and now we're pivoting to make sure that we are going all in on everything that we have in front of us this November. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you for that answer. Thank you for the, all the work that you and your teams are doing. Um, and we intend to uh, complement and support your efforts. So uh, looking forward to working with all of you. And now I do have the pleasure of introducing our last speaker. Uh, Debbie Nez Manuel is the daughter of a Navajo code talker and recognizes her opportunity to advocate for people is rooted in his service to our country. Uh, Debbie is a longtime community leader and activist. Uh, she is a pro profoundly impactful advocate for people of color in urban, rural, and remote communities around Arizona. She has extensive experience and expertise in mobilizing citizens into deep and meaningful community engagement. Debbie grew up in the Nav on the Navajo Nation in Northern Arizona and has lived in Phoenix in the metro area for three decades. She has had a successful career with Casey Family Programs in their partnership with Salt, River, Pima, Maricopa Indian Community. She has a comprehensive and exceptional understanding of the complexities surrounding the victimization of Native American women and girls. Debbie was instrumental to the unanimous passage in the Arizona Senate and House of HB 2570, monumental legislation establishing a 20 member, 21 member study committee on missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. The bill was the first of its kind in the nation and other states are following suit. The election of Debbie in January, 2020 was a historic milestone for the Arizona Democratic Party as she became the first indigenous national committee person. Um, so Debbie, we are um, really honored to have you. We are sorry that uh, we're some minutes behind, so we're glad that you could stay on. And uh, if you can stay for questions after you speak, we would be uh, really happy. Thank you so much. Sure, good morning, everybody. Salt River Indian Community Shugan, Shachene Eta, Megan Do, Haley Do, Shandin, Daliado, Shasti, A. Royce Manuel, Boliende. Good morning, everyone. Um, just letting you know that my my clans come from the, uh, the, the Cliff Dweller people. It's hard to code talk and go right back into English. Um, from the Cliff Dweller people, I'm born for the Sleepy Rock people of Nashchitty, New Mexico. My maternal grandparents are from Clagato, Arizona, uh, the Black Street Forest people. And I, um, I'm the proud granddaughter of a Navajo code talker, um, the Water's Edge people from Nashchitty. So I, while I am a citizen of the Navajo Nation, I live here in the Salt River Indian community with my three children, Megan, Haley, and Shandine, um, and I always acknowledge my husband, my late husband, Royce Manuel. Um, I just wanted to really say thank you to the speakers ahead of us. I think they couldn't have stressed some very, very important, important points about voting here in Arizona and the, the, the risk that we face, the threats that come at each, each and every one of each and every one of us, especially in Indian country. Um, I really appreciated the, the work that Franny has done. I was really proud of her, the fact that she called me right away and she said, Debbie, I have to sit down. I need names. Who can we get on the um, redistricting committee? Who can we recommend? Who can we encourage to apply? So we spent a few days. I went through my, I probably gave about 25 hardcore names. I said, these guys I know will do it. Uh, fortunately, we had two or three of them actually interviewed with the governor's office. And I was really proud to say that they went, made it through the cycle. Um, and it was good to test the, you know, test the process. I think that was really good. Um, second is, I think, you know, as we go forward, there are a lot of missed opportunities. I think when um, Charlie was talking about missed opportunities, um, if you recall back in 2020, many of the headlines wrote, um, read that, um, you know, so many 
groups of people voted some most of them white most you know black people of color and then they and then they put on the title something else and many native americans in arizona were seriously offended by that because they were calling us something else um and it it and and then the the very very well shared image of the nations who were turning out blue in favor of this administration um not because probably not probably because of any specific person but because of the values they stand for uh because of the things that they value most and so um i think there was an individual that spoke earlier to the fact that we need the democratic party to speak to the values we share not to persuade people into becoming democrats because we do share very similar if not the same things um i uh, want to speak very specifically to um another great missed opportunity outside of the political arena i work very closely with our communities um i do my best to engage tri all 21 tribes in arizona there are 22 land bases 21 tribes many of these tribes are sister tribes so you look at navajo hope uh, navajo apache and who are white mountain and san carlos they're all sister tribes they all speak very their language comes from the same place uh, the dialect might be different, but you look at Dana Atam, Gila River, Auction, and Salt River Indian community, they're all the same people. The government and their bright thinking thought these were different people because of where they're located. They all speak the same language. The government is who divided them into the places they are and therefore created nations for them. However, when we look at our nations in Arizona, I can tell you that I did a pretty good assessment outside of the political arena to see who is actually engaging with tribes. So I listed all of these agencies from both county, state, tribal, and national. Out of all of that centered here in Arizona, I could only come up between eight and 10 names. Agencies, agencies like the Intertribal Council, One Arizona, Instituto, um, you know, all of these different agencies, many of them say, yes, we're engaging people of color. I can tell you, I lived here in the Salt River Indian community for 17 years. I have never, ever had anybody come to my door and take time to educate me. I've never had any of these agencies come to our tribal community and say, hey, we have a presentation. Would you come over? I've never seen them collaborate together and, and engage a group of Native Americans. I call home to my family in Navajo, ask them, have you ever heard of any of these agencies? Have they ever stopped in, dropped in at the Capitol? Nope. I call Hopi, my other relatives, and I said, have you ever had anybody come over from any of these agencies, come over and give a presentation to you, educating you? Nope. Call my other relatives in San Carlos. Have you ever heard of any of these agencies? Nope. So I can tell you wholeheartedly, it's not happening. We are missing the boat. We are, we are completely missing it. So as a nonprofit organization, Morningstar Leaders is an organization that my husband, my late husband and I organized because we felt like our youth were being left out of the loop. We felt like that there was so many missed opportunities and we were just driven to find out what that was. So well, through a lot of planning with our youth organizing, we worked really, really um, closely with five cohorts of youth of 25. Then the pandemic happened. So we kind of put that on the back burner and said, okay, we've got to change this approach because of safety protocols. And so we found five very eager youth who are young adults who were doing taking all the measures to be safe uh, from the pandemic. And they said, we want to help. We want to make this happy because it's so important to us. We have our grandparents that taught us so many things and we have to get on this. I said, are you ready to organize? I said, I don't have much money. I don't have hardly anything, but I just need your, your will and your determination. And I can give you a little bit to make sure we um, offer you some sort of stipend. They said, we're all in. So if you go to the Morning Star Facebook page, you're going to see five ground roots organizers that are working to educate our youth. We have three trainings that are planned around the state, two of them, uh, two additional ones that are virtual. So that's a total of five trainings. These young people are learning quickly how to organize. They're learning quickly where they can go for funding to help make their training possible. They're going to local indigenous leaders like Gabby down in Tucson. We're looking at some of the judges. How did they get elected? What was important to them? What did, what did their voters need to know? Um, how are um, elected leaders up in Flagstaff 
you know, getting into office? What, 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 what did they miss and they learned? What were the lessons learned? And they're telling them, they're asked, answering questions. This is the kind of groundwork that we have to have for tribal voters. And so with the Morning Star leaders, we just kept working. We said, we're gonna frame this in a way where everyone understands what it means to vote from the bottom of the ballot. They understand, like Jim was saying, they understand how important it is. What is a board of supervisor? What do they do? You know, what are their responsibilities and how does it impact our tribal community or our tribal nation or our tribal nonprofits or the health issues that we face or the fuel or even the highways? Um, so much. Um, and I think all of our, uh, we all care about veterans, but I can tell you that Native Americans in Arizona have the highest, I mean, even across the country, they have the highest enlistment of Native Americans from all five branches of the military. Let's not get mixed up why they enlist. They didn't enlist to fight for the United States of America. They enlisted to fight for their nations, to protect their families, to protect their cultural sites. They fought hard. They used our language, you know, to fight for the things that, that they loved and valued most. And so when we think about why do we, why do we need to support veterans? There's, an, there's plenty of reasons, but on the Navajo Nation and many others, they get overlooked. And we have to do better than that. Um, I think those are the biggest things, the takeaways. But Morning Star Leaders is really organizing with five amazing youth. I always, you know, for those of you who um, who um, are aware, I lost my husband in July. It was he died to pancreatic cancer. It was a very very difficult situation. We we were very active in the community, and um, but I really believe my husband sent these five people to me to take care of business, to take care of Arizona. And I tell people, I, I've been telling people that I said, uh, we were, we were stretched so thin before these, these young people arrive. I said, I didn't know how I was going to do it, but one day they just all showed up one after the other. And I'm like, where are they coming from? But it's amazing. These young people have the energy and, you know, the, the eagerness to learn. And so i try to put all of that to use. And I really believe that, you know, it, this race that we have before us is going to be one of the most um, important. I mean, every race seems to be important every time, but if we have a governor um, who, who advocates and listens to tribes and thinks about them, you know, who is a staunch, you know, uh, supporter, Arizona will do better, but we also have to maintain the majority and so we really need to make sure that Kelly gets reelected. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. And like Charlie, I try not to go into the whole cinema conversation because I know the race that we have is really vital for Kelly. So we've got to stay focused on that and then deal with the other stuff as it comes. So I tried to talk fast so I wouldn't hold you guys up, but um, I am open for questions. Debbie, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your, your thoughts and your experience. And this group that you have started with the five young leaders just really does sound amazing. We have a question in the box about that. Anybody else, if you have a question, type star star hand up in the box. Um, to start off with though, uh, well, Debbie, first I'll ask Jim's question, which is how can uh, we financially support this sure. new project of yours. If you go to um, a website, it's called morningstarleaders.org. There's a donation link there. There's two of them. One is the GoFundMe. That's specific to the voter voter education trainings that we're hosting. And then there's another one uh, that can just support the programs in general, but it's there. Um, let me go ahead and okay. pull it up and then drop it down in the link. And then I you'll think be- somebody's got it already. Is it morningstarleaders.org? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Jennifer, so fast. Um, yeah. Can you tell us which of the tribes these five young people are from? And they, are they dividing Arizona in a in a tribal way, in a geographical way, or how is it going to work? Um, it they come from they come from all over the place. They really um, they they come from all over the place, but at the same time, they understand that um, they're they that the any kind of voting that happens is going to be 
supportive to Indian country. And when we say Indian country, it's not just our tribes, it's people who come from out of state who live in Arizona. So like Jennifer, Jennifer Main is a great example of um, native being Native American, she's white earth nation, and she's led so many important and crucial bills. And I worked really closely with her to help her with the missing and murdered indigenous women, but she doesn't come from any of the tribes in Arizona. So when we talk about it, we say Indian country. Um, there are other people who are elected who may not be from an Arizona tribe, but they call Arizona home. So um, our young people are primarily Navajo. One is Zuni and the other one is Quetzal from down south. Um, and I think we have, yeah, that's it. Um, but they're, they're amazing. We just brought on a high school person who will dedicate 10 hours to helping us put together some some um, good ideas for our high school students to get them registered to vote. And um, she's a great artist. And so she's gonna set her mind to pulling 18 year olders in. Wow, wow, this is where we need to be. This is the future. So we had a few questions that came in earlier and why, while they look a little bit backwards, um, I hope that we can take a forward view on it. But one is 2020, we like to say the overseas vote uh, you know, elected Biden in Arizona because of our 19,000 votes and him winning by 12. However, we know that the Native American vote was out, uh, astounding, outstanding in 2020 that Native mm -hmm. Americans voted like never before. There were some wonderful photos front page uh, in the Arizona Republic of Navajo on their way to the polls on horseback. Can you mm -hmm. tell us how and how did we make this happen? How did you make this happen in 2020? And then the second part, our second question would be with all of the terrible voting bills that are being uh, proposed and passed in our Republican uh, razor thin majority legislature, which are the worst for the Native American community? Is it restricting drop boxes, restricting mail voting by postal mail? Um, yeah, so both of those kind of look backwards, but help us to look forward, I hope, and, and plan our actions. There were, sure, there were three significant areas that contributed to that, to that, um, to the native turnout. One was the Northeast Arizona Democrats who um, are uh, working with Coconino, Apache, and um, Navajo County, led by, led by Janie Parrish, a Navajo woman. And who knows that area very well, and um, and then here in in down south was Indivisible Thano, which was led by a group of young women who um, included um, April Ignacio, and then here in Maricopa County, our region, uh, the center central region, there was probably about five of us boots on the ground, and we worked hard. We realized that the 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 party really focused on early voter turnout. But what a lot of people don't know is that Native Americans, they vote like Republicans, they vote on election day, they create the lines. And I, I couldn't say that out loud, you know, when I was on social media, but I'm telling you all that that's how they vote. They, they like to go to the polls because there's mutton stew there, there's food, there's swag, there's, there's their social interactions, there's activities happen, they like to vote on election day. So well, the mission for Arizona and Biden campaigns were just, you know, in their holding on to their inventory. I went over to the, one of the setups and I said, "Why are all these signs here? Why aren't they in the communities? Why aren't they seeing them? Because they need these constant reminders." I really, I, my grandma energy came out. I said, "No, load all that stuff up in my ride right now." I said, "I'm taking them," and they're like. Well, these are reserved for local districts. I said, why? Because they already voted in the early voter turnout. What are you saving those signs for? Somebody needs them. So I made them load up all the rebar. I loaded up um, three truckloads of probably 20 to 50 signs. And I went to San Carlos, to White Mountain. I went over to Pascuayaki, to Akchin, to, I met um, a group of people halfway down to Tona. I, we put all those signs out and I said, and I took it straight over to Leela River and in community to the governor. And I said, you need these signs, put them out. And he's like, okay, I'll get to work. Me telling a governor what to do was like, oh, I said, he's a relative. I just, I can boss him around for this moment, but he's got to put up these signs. And we got 
people to pray we got them to understand that you know if they were gonna if they were gonna sit at home they had no right to complain if the outcome was different than what they wanted second is that this i said this election is bigger than you or me even bigger than our families i said i understand if you don't like trump but you're not voting because he's the candidate or Biden's the candidate. You're doing it because the next four years are going to be important to your own life and you have to do something about it. You can't just sit back and watch. So I think that grandma voice really helped them understand they need to get off the couch, you know, go find a creative way to get their relatives out. And it was really beautiful to see the horseback riding, to see the youth running together to the polls. Uh, to do a fun run to the polls. We seen, oh, one of the things that went viral, if I'm not sure if you've seen it, was when the crown dancers danced down to the polls. The crown dancers, I want to say it was in White Mountain, led a, a uh, poll parade. The crown dancers took all of these dancers down to the polls. It was happening all over. It was amazing to see. And it was really beautiful to see the community empowered um, and again, they turned out on election day. I went down to Tempe, um, Tempe Library and I saw the long lines and I was looking, I'm like, who are all these people? It, it crossed my mind that they were all Republicans. And then, but when what was happening on in Indian country and all the tribal nations is there were long lines, the natives were at the polls. So um, the other, the, to answer the other question was the worst uh, measures that are out there for Indian country, it's last minute poll changes or not having access to a poll, a place where you can use a, a, a site becomes a poll. You know, there's natives who do early uh, ballot votes. They do that. Um, but one of the ch uh, challenging things too is if you, if you live in a re remote or rural part of Arizona, um, a lot of times your vehicle can only fit like, you know, three people, four people. You don't have vans, they're not affordable. Um, you have little economy cars because you got to drive far and fuel up and save gas. And so not everybody can get in. So you can't fit everybody into a car. So somebody can get, you know, get the ballots and take them and drop it off. And that way you can, during the pandemic also, there were measures where only one person could travel into town. There were police watching the road. You couldn't gather in, in large numbers. So you couldn't have four or five people in a car. They wouldn't let you. They, they, were, they were taking precautions because of the pandemic and only one person could travel. So there was a lot of different hurdles that every, you know, people of color in Indian country had to do. They had to find ways and get it done. But, you know, the lack of polls consistent or changing them at the last minute when it's been posted for the last, you know, so many days, this is where voting is going to take place. And then they change it. It creates, you know, confusion, especially for our elders, um, if they if they don't get it or if an announcement wasn't made on the radio. I think the other thing is people don't know that there's radio in Indian country is the only way to communicate to our elders. They're the ones who lead to tell the young people do this, do that, get this done. Um, we need to do this. You know, the radio is the only way. And it's very different than, say, Maricopa County, where you get postcards or email or text messages. Um, those things are very, very um, different. Um, thank you for that, Debbie. I mean, I've seen being a poll watcher before uh, people coming to the wrong polling place. Of course, in Arizona, this past election, you you could still vote. Um, you know, uh, if you weren't in the in your precinct, you could still get a ballot that would be printed for you, but it's a different thing in a urban setting. If you're, if you decide to go to a different one or sent to a different one, like you are in some states, quite a different thing in Indian country. Yeah. If you would be going to a different polling place, it could be uh, scores of miles, hours away from the place that you went to. So it seems very important. To, also, to let you know the, to let you know too, is broadband is real. It is a real thing. The other day I went up there to Clagato chapter to do a presentation because I was um, helping them to organize uh, for fundraising. I stood there and I was trying to get online because say, someone asked me a question. I went to my phone that I use here in Maricopa County where it comes instantly. I stood up there and I waited and I waited and I waited. 
that phone would not work. I got so frustrated. I said, I'll get back to you. I put my phone down. I was talking, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. I finally went back to my phone. It was finally there. That's how we lose people because there's no broadband service. They can't use their phones that you and I use to get online. And so I learned my lesson when I went back, I printed everything and I took it back that way without having to worry about accessing the internet. And COVID really taught us this too. So I hope that some of this, um, I can't remember the name of the bill, but the COVID Recovery Act, I know that there is money put aside to increase uh, internet uh, across Indian country and other rural areas. So we really hope that's happening. Um, Debbie, uh, I also wanted to say, I'm so happy that those signs work because mm -hmm. I had a trunk load that I pounded into very hard ground on the McDowell Indian <laughs> Reservation near to Scottsdale. And I tell you, putting signs up mostly around here is really good for your arms. And you need you a were. and a screwdriver to make a hole in there. And I'm, I'm so happy that um, there weren't many around where I was putting them up. Um, you were the other person doing it because I sent signs with a, a community member from there. And I said, take these signs. And she's like, okay. And she texts, I said, text me if you have any questions. She texts me. She says, Debbie, there's a little bit of, there's a handful of Biden signs here. And I'm like, where did they come from? I said, who's putting them out there? She says, I don't know, but I'll try to, you know, spread them <laughs> apart. And you were the one. I was like, I'm really happy, I'm there? Really happy to, that somebody saw them. Uh, it has been so great to have you. Thank you for joining us. All the very best with your new project. Know that we will be supporting you. We will look forward to working with you this year as we make a difference in the midterms. And for the other seven DNC members from uh, Democrats Abroad, look forward to seeing you in person and your two colleagues, uh, Luis and, and Mark Robert at our meeting in DC, which we hope will be held finally in person <laughs> at the beginning of March. So thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, we look forward to seeing you and again and working with you. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Oh, happy statehood day. Yeah, you too. Thank you <laughs> so much. Bye bye. Okay. So everyone on the call, we know that we're, uh, we're running a little bit late, but what a fast, what, you know, fascinating guests we've had. It's been both grounding and inspiring to hear from these organizers and experts on the ground. And now we, wanted, we do wanna talk quickly about what we can do from abroad beyond getting our ballots and voting, which of course is number one and telling all of our friends and families and colleagues, which is number two. We have two other things that we wanna talk about. So I'm first gonna pass the microphone to Danny Follett from Paris and then to Kate Sawyer from Frankfurt to describe these two important actions you can take. And Danny is first, She's going to be talking about how to sign candidate petitions online. And she's asked me to say a sentence or two about how important this is. Um, every candidate needs thousands of signatures to get on the Democratic ballot. They are running all over Arizona with clipboards, getting people to sign these petitions. We can do it online. Other people can do it online. Many of the candidates are trying to get twice the number they need because they know some signatures will be thrown out. So the process itself, it's not honor, onerous. I thought it was going to be when I went on there, I was really pretty thrilled. One thing that you need to know before you go in there, you can only sign for a candidate, one candidate in each race. I tried to sign for two and, and quickly found out that when I signed for the first, the others were closed. So. If you are not sure about candidates, you can go online really easily now to find out about them to make your choice. But please do go on and sign for a candidate in every race that you will see on your screen. And now Danny's gonna tell you how to do it. Hi, Danny, thank you so much. Hi everybody, thank you so much, Katie. Uh, so, so I'm going to tell you how to sign that and it's actually very, very easy. So uh, to introduce myself, I'm chair of Democrats Abroad France and I'm a voter in Green Valley, Arizona. So I go back to Arizona very often. So I'm a proud uh, resident now, of, uh, voting resident of Arizona. So in Arizona, as in many states, uh, uh, candidates are required to obtain a minimum number of petition signatures to appear on the ballot, okay? So uh, most of the time, as Katie said, you're, they're running around with clipboards and getting in-person signatures. 
it's now possible to do this in Arizona. And it's actually one of the only places in the nation that allows this. There's only Arizona, Washington, DC, New Jersey only very recently started it, and then also Denver, Colorado, according to Ballotpedia, are places that you can sign on an online portal where you can get, uh, you can sign the candidates' petitions. So we should make use of that being uh, voters in Arizona. Also, as you know, so in order to be on the ballot, any candidate has to get a certain number of voters. So uh, for a US Senator or state office, you need one quarter of 1% of the total number of qualified signers in the state. So that would mean independents or Democrats, registered Democrats, to, in order to sign for Democratic candidates. Um, and the number of people who can sign for or who must sign for it depends or it varies depending on the race. So as Katie mentioned, you can only sign for one candidate per race in most races. Um, basically, you're just signing a petition to get them on the ballot in the race. Uh, you can only sign ballots, uh, petitions for candidates running in your voting district. So it's a bit like voting in the primaries. And this is happening right now. It's happening up until March 1st. So this is the time when you need to, uh, the, the candidates need to get their signatures. Uh, I think somebody asked in the chat, Sue, whether or not uh, this is for primaries or for general. It's for the primaries. It's basically to get on the ballot at all. And so in order to do so, you go to this website, and I think we're going to put the website link in the chat. Somebody will do that, thanks. Uh, you enter your name, date of birth, your driver's license number, or your veg voter registration number, plus the last four digits of your social security number. So either driver's license or voter registration number plus last four digits of social security. Then you verify your address because they'll find you in the list. They already have your address. You don't have to put your address in. Uh, then you select the petition that you'd like to sign in the drop down list of different petitions and you click on sign. And then it takes you to a page where you give your email address and you agree to sign. So it's extremely simple, very easy. It takes less than a minute to sign a petition. There's also a video that explains how to do this process. And then we can put that link also in the chat. So uh, it's something that we can do from abroad, something that's extremely uh, useful and easy and uh, a way to, to participate even more in our democratic system. Thank you very much, Danny. I was a little afraid when I went to do it online because I have helped get signatures on and I've been asked to sign and it, people are being so careful. Make sure you're between the lines, make sure your address is written just like on your voter registration, your name. And we know that every candidate or many candidates are paying people to then go through their petitions and check up before they submit the name. So it's really a labor intensive and a costly process for the campaigns. But online, it was really easy. Once you get your ID in there, you must type your name just as it is on your voting record. But once you do that and you put in those IDs, it gives you your address. And then it gives you the races that you can sign the petitions for. So um, it really is easy. It really is fast. And we put the links in the chat. So Arizonans, go there and tell your family and friends and colleagues to go there too even if they're back in Arizona, because you know you don't have to be abroad. Did we mention the deadline, Danny? March 1st? I, yes, I mentioned March 1st. Okay, please do it by March 1st because we understand it's going, the website's gonna come down for them to put in the redistricting information. Uh, it will come up again, but it could be down for weeks. So by March 1st. Um, thanks so much, Danny. And now we are gonna hear from Kate Sawyer about um, how to track legislation, and we got plenty of bad bills on all kinds of topics um, in Arizona, and take some tiny actions. So Kate, it's all yours. Right. So what we want to bring to your attention is an organization called the Civic Engagement Beyond Voting. Um, it's, <clears throat> you can just find it on the internet on www.cebv. Dot us, or you can just type into your internet browser, civic engagement beyond voting. It's basically a grassroots nonpartisan organization in Arizona. The goal is to increase Arizona voters' um, voices in the state legislature. And they do this primarily in two, in two ways. One is they, um, they advocate for this request to speak system and they provide on, it's basically an online tool to give feedback to state legislatures. If you go on their website, you'll see they provide trainings for how you do this. They have an online uh, video. 
um, and they encourage your participation in that. The other thing, which is also especially important for our overseas voters, is that they they have a weekly. Um, you can sign up to receive their weekly um, Arizona legislature update, and so it's a weekly update by which they um, they produce this condensed, easy to follow um, weekly overview that highlights what's going on in the state legislature. Um, describing the most notable bills, bills of the session and, um, and tracking their progress. Um, so that's all I'll say about that, except it would be very helpful in our organization now of the Arizona State team of um, Democrats abroad, if anyone is particularly interested, inspired to follow local, um, the state legislative um, bills and, and happenings, um, we would really appreciate somebody who would step forward, who would follow this for the Arizona State team and, and kind of take that on. So if you're interested, please let us know. And then on another note, I just wanted to add, um, I know we may not have time to get to necessarily to voters questions, but I would encourage anyone who has questions about voting, um, to get in touch with us. It's really, you know, any issues, questions, um, um, questions about exchanges you may have had with your county recorder office, et cetera. It's really helpful from the voter assistance and kind of election integrity perspective that we get this information on um, the experiences of our voters so that we can identify any broader issues, any trends, um, we can look at state level, at county level. So it's helpful just to be in touch with us. Don't, don't hesitate. And the email on that is info at democratsabroad.org. Thanks. Kate, thank you very much. Danny, thank you. Um, we will stay on for questions of any kind, voting. Um, otherwise, I think our guest speakers have left, but we'll hang around for questions. But we are going to sort of uh, wrap up the call. So Avi, would you go ahead? You're on mute. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I want to thank everybody who did join us on this call. I think it was very inspiring. And I especially want to thank Adrian, Charlie, and Debbie, our guest speakers from Arizona. And thank you to Jennifer, Karen, and Beverly for our help on the tech side. Once again, just go to votefromabroad.org to make sure that you get your ballots for the 2022 election. If you want to join a state team like the Arizona state team, and I think that'll go up on the, on the chat also, state team at democratsabroad.org to find out about our meetings. We're going to be meeting tomorrow, 10 o'clock Arizona time on the 15th and again on the 22nd. Katie. Okay, good. So we didn't put it in the chat, but we will in a minute. If you, there it is. If you want to email us, it's states at democratsabroad.org. Um, and there's our Slack channel, and we'd be happy to see you at any of these meetings. Uh, we are going to stay on a few minutes, but first I'd like to give a shout out to all of the great volunteers across Democrats Abroad, um, both on camera or behind the scenes. Uh, we know that that all of these teams, and we have dozens of them need your help. So please, if you want to help any of the 10 state teams or the 11 caucuses, the five task forces or the other global teams, uh, go to democratsabroad.org slash volunteer and figure out where you can, you know, where your skills or time would fit to help one of these teams. And your support goes a very long way, a very long way since our overhead is almost nothing if you donate. So go to democratsabroad.org slash donate. Any amount helps us to not only put on events like this, which by the way, cost us nothing except a lot of people's time and energy, but our GOTV efforts where the costs are minimal and the return is magnificent. So please go to democratsabroad.org slash donate. And now this meeting I think is over. We're going to stop the recording if we're still recording, but we will hang around and